welcome to all our guests, and not only Garden Grove, but others who are here. Uh, many times at, in United at LA, we have people who come by, and we want to welcome them, make sure they feel welcome. So if you don't know somebody, it may not be that they're from the Garden Grove or LA congregation. It may be somebody here seeking a home. So if you see somebody you don't know, reach out the hand of fellowship. Make them feel warm, because this is a warm church, and make sure they know that's who we are, part of God's family. We live in a society of incredible speed and complexity. Philip Chard, in an article in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, he's a fellow cheese head, which I'm proud of, entitled Applying Breaks That Can Cure Hurry Sickness, writes the following about the speed and the complexity of our society and how it can impact our thoughts and our brains. I've written before about a malady called time urgency, which is a rapidly expanding threat to mental health, both individual and collective. This condition is characterized by a chronic state of frantic hurrying, compelling people to rush not only when they must, but also when there's no reason to do so. Neuroscience is compiling evidence that infotech, smartphones, TVs, computers, emailing, texting, gaming, etc., wires our brains with a need for speed. It's a long way from Scrabble to World of Warcraft or from handwritten notes to an endless barrage of emails. So after sufficient exposure to light speed media, the brain's inner clock accelerates. What happens to your brain on speed? Well, for one, your life rushes by in a blur, leaving you wondering, where did time go? This perceptual blur obscures much of the potential enjoyment in life, leaving no time to smell the proverbial roses. I wonder, as we reflected on our lives these past few weeks, especially in this days of unleavened bread, and where we have fallen short, how much of our falling short is due to our frantic pace that we live in? How it has impacted us, how it beats us down, and as a result, we let our guard down. We become tired, weary, maybe resulting in an over-reliance on alcohol. Maybe we have escapism and we go to the internet to escape the challenges we face. Maybe we have a short fuse with our families and our loved ones. Maybe due to all the demands on our time, we're growing weary of helping others. Maybe we just fail to listen to someone, maybe our children talking to us, maybe our spouse, because we're so burnt out with our own challenges. Maybe we feel like giving up. And these complications that related to a complex and rushed life results in a number of problems for us. Health problems such as headaches, ulcers, blood pressure, family problems such as divorce, poor quality time with members of our family, emotional problems, burnout, depression, just chronic tiredness, and spiritual problems as well. Apathy, distance, meaninglessness. The complexities of this society and the speed for which the society goes can take a toll. It can confuse us and can distract us from our purpose on this earth. The Bible discusses the time of the end. It will be a time of unprecedented knowledge growth along with a frantic pace related to that. Turn to Daniel 12, verse 4. Daniel 12, verse 4. Daniel 12, verse 4. Daniel 12, verse 4. It says, But thou, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. But many shall run to and fro and the knowledge shall be increased. During our lifetimes, knowledge 
and technology has been unimaginably increased. Can you imagine someone 50 years ago who passed away 50 years ago would come to today and be absolutely amazed by the gadgetry, the communications we have this day. There's been advances in communication, transportation, medicine, science, electronics in this age of increasing knowledge and opportunity. However, with the increased knowledge, with the increased information that's available, people have be, appeared to be more lost and more confused. They're being inundated. Daniel 12, verse 4, in the phrase, in the phrase to and fro, is not limited to people just merely going to and fro, traveling from one place to another. While it does mean that, the Hebrew indicates something that is entirely going on in one's mind. It could mean that people are tossing back and forth as though they're in the midst of a puzzle, a mystery that they're unable to figure out. It may be with all the knowledge they're being bombarded with, they become confused and stressed and their minds are going back and forth because of all the activity that's going on around him. With so much going on around us, rapid changes, increased complexity, so much that mankind at the end of the, this age will be confused and searching. Turn to 2 Timothy 3 verse 1. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. And I'd like to read from the English Standard Version. And we'll start in verse 1 and then we'll go down to verse 7. In verse 1 it says, But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. And if we go down to verse 7... Always learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. Despite man's academic pursuits, the quest for knowledge, Paul warns that at the end times, many will always be learning, many be seeking knowledge, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. In other words, their, their desire for knowledge is misdirected. And this quest will lead people to look to teachers who fit their understanding, who fit their knowledge base. Turn to 2 Timothy, just a page down, chapter 4. 2 Timothy, chapter 4, beginning verse 3. It says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears. They heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn away their ears from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Having knowledge, accessibility to that knowledge, does not mean one understands truth. And as we look at the world around us, and we see the characteristics of man foretold by Paul in 2 Timothy, as time goes on, this will only become more prevalent. The time of the end, indeed the time we live now, will be a time of incredible growth of knowledge, but it'll also be a time of incredible confusion. Our society has gone beyond living life to the fullest. It suffers from being overfull. And it can impact our walk in this life. We can unknowingly find ourselves also being overfull. And there's two areas where we can find ourselves overfilling. The first is in the area of possessions. In the area of possessions. Life, especially in this Western world, is overfilled with possessions. Homes are bigger than they ever have been before. And people are renting self-storage spaces just to keep their belongings even though they own a home. And they have stuff in their basements and attics and garages overfilled. And even if we're not of that moment of hyperabundance on our own, we're probably still trying to accumulate possessions, aren't we? Because we're worried that we might be missing out of something if we don't have a certain thing, or we're envious of what someone else has. 
We want the American dream, and we deserve it, don't we? The philosophy of life for this day permeates our society, and it can impact us. We can begin to evaluate our individual successes, and I'm especially talking to our young adults. We can evaluate our success by our possessions and what we believe we're lacking, even though we have all been blessed with so very much. Another, another area we can be overfull is activities. We wake up in the morning to look at our Facebook page on our iPhone or answer our emails and we head off to work and we have to take care of our children to get them to their extracurricular activities and our iPhone pings all day with texts or maybe emails buzzing the phone. And when we're talking to someone, do we sometimes take a look at our iPhone and see what's going on in Facebook and not really directing our attention to them? I, I was at a meeting yesterday and I would say half the people, it was a very poignant discussion, were looking at their phones and their texts and their emails. Maybe we're the family that not everybody can come home at the same time, so we eat in shifts. And then our late nights, again, are delving in emails, trying to plan for the future, paying bills, and we get up in the morning, and we go through it again. And the Sabbath doesn't seem to be much better because we have to follow our routines as well. And Sunday, well, we got to catch up for what we missed during the week. We have so many choices and maybe we have the money to take advantage of those opportunities, the transportation to get there, so we try to do it all until life becomes a burden, stressed out, burned out, sleep deprived, and ultimately disillusioned. Unfortunately, the things we used to love are now a chore. We're overfilled and we feel helpless in the situation we find ourselves. We find ourselves impatient even with little th things. How many times have we been angry at our computer when that little circle goes around and around and we're waiting and we start saying things to our computer like they're actually listening? <laughs> maybe it may be we, that we recognize our current lifestyle and patterns of being are not working, but we just can't disengage from the rat race. Life is too busy, too many commitments, too fast, no fun, and something has to give. All work and no play is no fun. All play and no work is no purpose. There has to be a balance in life, and we have to find that happy medium in order to experience true happiness. Turn to Ecclesiastes 7, verse 16. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 16. And I would like to read from the New Living Translation, if you don't mind. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 16 through 18. It states, so don't be too good or too wise. Why destroy yourself? On the other hand, don't be too wicked either. Don't be a fool. Why die before your time? Pay attention to these instructions, for anyone who fears God will avoid both extremes. We are to avoid extremes. Yet in this complex world, this busy world, extremes are all around us. There's even extreme games, the X games. The quest for affluence, the quest for success, the quest to be popular, the quest to be noticed is demanding. It demands our time, it demands our energy, but it comes with a price. In John 10, verse 10, we don't need to turn there, Christ states that he came upon this earth so those that may be called may live life more abundantly. And the Greek word that Christ uses in John 10, 10, describes the kind of life he came to teach his disciples, meaning it actually means super abundant, overflowing, above a certain quantity, a quantity so abundant as to be considerably more than one would expect or anticipate. Now, we realize Christ meant this spiritually, but I think he also meant it in our physical lives as well. 
The it, problem is, in our complex, hurried, busy world, we may not even realize or appreciate the blessings we've been given because we've accepted the norms of this society. Its emphasis on living the here and now with the emphasis, the overemphasis on consumerism. In order to appreciate the blessings we have, we may need to disengage from the complexities of this life as much as we are able to. We need to simplify our lives. Psalm 116, verse 6, we need to simplify our lives. Psalm 116, verse 6. And I'd like to read from the English Standard Version. Psalm 116, verse 6. It states in the Psalm 116, verse 6, The Lord preserves the simple, and when I was brought low, he saved me. So today I would like to discuss three basic ways we can simplify our lives in this complex and hurried world. The first way we can simplify our lives is to simplify the way we communicate. Simplify the way we communicate. James 3, verse 10. James 3, verse 10. Simplify the way we communicate. James 3, verse 10. James 3, verse 10. Actually, I'd like to go to verse 8, excuse me, verse 8. But no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil, full of deadly poison. We bless it with our Lord, our Father, and we curse, with the, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes blessings and cursing. My brothers, these things should not be so. Many times we don't take the time to think about what we're saying. Sometimes we emotionally blurt out something, don't we? Or we react and state things that are inappropriate and we don't even have all the facts. James tells us that as members of God's family, we cannot be duplicitous in our speech. We need to be consistent. We cannot go before God and say one thing and then say things about others in a derogatory or negative way. And the problem is many times our emotions get in the way of rational thought and so we need to guard our tongue. In our conversations, to be honest, if we look at them, the less we say is probably the better, especially during emotional times, especially at times when we're stressed. A dean I once worked for uh, gave me a solid piece of advice when he first came and he talked to us he says that I tried to live by never never send an email with bad news call instead or meet the person instead how many times have we blistered off an email or a text and we regret it later we should not be doing that when we step back and analyze our communications is what we say what we write, more negative or positive? Leo, Leah Baratsky, in an article entitled Lost in Translation from the Wall Street Journal, makes the following analysis about a study that dealt about the importance of what we say. And it really is interesting. It turns out that if you change how people talk, that changes how they think. If people learn another language, they inadvertently also learn a new way of looking at the world. When bilingual people switch from one language to another, they start thinking differently. All this new research shows us that the language we speak not only reflects or expresses our thoughts, but also shapes the very thoughts we wish to express. The structures exist in our language that profoundly shape how we construct reality. Thus, the words we use are powerful, 
And this study shows that the language we use can shape the way we look at the world. It gives an understanding why God in Zephaniah 3.9 will introduce a new language in the kingdom. This study shows rational differences in language. It shows a relationship about the words we use and how it impacts our thinking process. It is not only what comes out of the mouth that's a reflection of our mind, what we say can also impact our minds, our view of reality. Thus, we really need to consider the words we use. We need to simplify our speaking. A second way to simplify our lives in this complex world is to simplify our time. Simplify our time. We live in a world that's very complicated. There's so much information to process, email, voicemail, text, Twitter, phone calls, even the evil Facebook. I put the evil on it, that's my my take on it. They all require our time. There's so much going on, so much connection, and it's not all bad. Staying in touch with people uh, is a good thing. I know my wife is caught up with people she knew in college, and it's a wonderful thing, Facebook, but sometimes being plugged in all the time is not good. Sometimes we need to take a step back and reflect. Sometimes we are too busy to realize we're too busy. Paul writes of redeeming a time in Ephesians 5, verse 16. Ephesians 5, verse 16. Ephesians 5, verse 16. Ephesians 5, verse 15, we'll start there. Then see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Redeem means to buy up for oneself, to buy up an opportunity. When connected to time, it means to take advantage of an opportunity that comes before us. And since we are dealing with time, time passes by. And we must take advantage of each opportunity. If an opportunity is missed, we just can't go back. It cannot be recalled. And we live in a hectic world and pulled in so many directions that what we try to do is do it all. And we have to, however, make choices each and every day of what we can and what we cannot do and how our energy will be spent or we will burn out. Many of us try to do two things at once, affectionately called multitasking, and it's commonly called in our modern world. Multitasking is like playing tennis with two balls. That's what multitasking is, or three, or four. And when you think what you're doing is important, multitasking is a practice to be avoided because you just can't keep up. It's not possible to focus. It's a myth that we think we could do two tasks simultaneously as as well as we do one. It's a myth. It's not true. So if multitasking isn't the answer, what is? Psalm 90 verse 12 states in the prayer of Moses, we don't need to turn there, so teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. The New Living Translation states this as follows, Teach us to realize the brevity of life so we may grow in wisdom. This scripture hits me hard. This week, I lost a dear friend at the medical school. He was a surgeon, world-renowned, nationally renowned surgeon who worked with deaf children. And I saw him a week before talking on the phone, and he succumbed to cancer. And he did not look well. In fact, we laughed about a situation that we both experienced, and within a week, he was gone. Life is precious, and working for a medical school, one of the things I do is uh, our administrative office is next to our cancer hospital, so many times I have to go through the cancer center waiting room and see people there waiting, and it hits hard to see the young and the old. I know one time I recently saw one young man that was the age of one of my sons. 
and it was hard to recoup when you realize. And the caretaker, the mother, I think it was, was gently com comforting the young man. Life is short. Life is precious. The phrase, numbers are days, expresses the thought of putting things in order, arranging things, prioritizing things, because life goes by fast. Moses wanted us to remember that the remaining number of days for all of us is each day we gain an age is one less day we have to use in our life, in our physical life. This scripture reminds us because we rarely make a conscious relationship between our actions on a daily basis and our mortality. At, so, at times we're so busy living for the moment we fail to see a connection between our conduct and our limited lifespan. We live in a world that, if not careful, we can become so engrossed in inconsequential matters that we have no times for matters of true importance. As a result, time dissipates, and we wonder, where has it gone? We need to periodically step back, meditate, and reflect on what's truly important and properly prioritize the time we have been given. And sometimes that means to take a break from it all. Sometimes it means to go to the beach and watch a sunset or go camping. Spending time and go hiking or spending time with people that mean so much to you. It does not always mean achievement, obtaining things, gaining the admiration of others. Our days are numbered, young and old, our days are numbered, and we need to make the most use of them each and every day. Not in chasing the here and now, but investing what's really important, our relationship with God, our relationship with other families, and our relationship with those of God's family. A third way to simplify our lives in this complex world is to simplify our finances. Simplify our finances. And we live in a world where there's pressures on our finances all the time. And too often in life, people go through life not having a firm grip on their financial situation. It can happen to us, and all of a sudden, one day we find we're in financial trouble with seemingly no way out. I would like to read from an article entitled America's Skyrocketing Credit Card Limit by Amy Peachy and CBS Money Watch on March 15th, on March 10th, 2015. The U.S. economy may be strengthening. By one measure, Americans are flunking the basics of personal finance. Credit card debt is ballooning, leaving American households with a net increase of 57.1 billion of new credit card debt in 2014, according to a new survey from CardHub. The credit card comparison site said it's forecasting new credit card debt will rise 5% in 2015, reaching $60 billion this year. With the increased spending, could signal Americans are feeling more sanguine about their prospects in the economy. It's also a cause for concern, given that most workers aren't seeing the type of wage growth that would support the higher spending. The surge has left the average household credit card balance at almost $7,200, or not far from the 8,300 level that Card Hubs considers unsustainable. When we find ourselves in financial difficulties, we can experience resentment, don't we? Or denial, stress, anger, frustration, regret, shame, embarrassment. Fear. It can take a toll on ourselves, it can take a toll on our family and friends, and it can take a toll on our relationship with God. And it's easy to spend money. You get those offers probably all the time in the mail or in emails. We live in a credit card craze society, and spending is easy. What's not easy is spending money wisely. So there's two ways we can simplify our Finances, two simple principles. One, first simple principle, learn to be content with what we have. It's been said contentment is not the fulfillment of what you want, but the realization of what you already have. 
Let me try that again. Contentment is not the fulfillment of what you want, but the realization of what you already have. The affluence of our Western culture has created an epidemic of coveting more than anyone else has. Our society craves more and more, and we want more and more, and they don't really enjoy what they already have. At its core, a simple person is a satisfied person. Indeed, the more we have, the more we have to take care of it. And we might actually think we're, by accumulating more, we're making life easier, and we're actually making our lives far more complex. In Philippians 4.11, you don't need to turn there, Paul states, he learned to be content no matter what his circumstances were. Indeed, contentment is a key factor in approaching our finances. Along with contentment, we simplify our finance to the second principle, and that's planning, establishing a budget. A budget is a plan. That's all it is. It plans revenue and then prioritizes our expenses. Proverbs 22, verse 3 states, A sensible man watches for his problems ahead and prepares to meet them. A simpleton never looks and suffers the consequences. A budget gives us simply an idea of how we're spending money and prioritizes our spending, what we truly can afford, what is a need versus what is a want. And then we can ascertain if we're spending too little or too much. It gives us a chance to look ahead and plan. And then we don't find ourselves in a frantic situation when we constantly get into debt in order to stay afloat. Learning to be content in establishing a budget and living by it is a way to simplify our finances in this complex day and age. We live in a complex society, a society that's constantly running, constantly seeking stimulation. Yet God wants us to live a peaceful life in this complex world. So how do we do that? We simplify our communications, that our speech is consistent, Sometimes using less words is more, especially when we're stressed and we're emotional. Never send bad news. Never send an emotional email or text. We need to simplify our time. We need to make most of the time God has given us on this earth. And that means we take a break from this hectic life we live sometimes. We meditate. We reflect on what's truly important. Not just during these days of unleavened bread, but all the time, but every day. And we need to simplify our finances. If we focus our thought on our blessings and learn to be content with them, we will be content. We also need to plan and use our budget wisely to use the funds we receive. In conclusion, you will not find the word simplify in the King James Version of the Bible. However, God's word, as we read it as a whole, directs us to live a life free of complications, doesn't it? Or confusion, or stress, and and anxiety. It's about having the right priorities. And we're not to be mired in the seemingly endless complexity of life. I wonder, if we were to take an honest look at ourselves, I wonder how many of us would agree and would admit that many of our shortfalls, many of our missing the mark, was just due to not simplifying our lives, being caught up in the crazy pace and the crazy ideas of this society, of what is success. And if that's the case, what is our chance of overcoming if we revert back to the life we find ourselves in? what was causing us to fall short. We won't have the reminder of eating unleavened bread as a physical reminder that we are to reflect upon our shortcomings. We'll be back to our daily routine. It may be time for a change to make the effort to simplify our lives. We make life complicated. And through making our life complicated, we can become confused, stressed, anxious, angry, discouraged. And that is not what God wants from us. It is not what God intends for his children. Turn to Luke 12, verse 22. Luke 12, verse 22. 
Luke 12, verse 22. And he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about nor about your body, what you will put on, for life is more than food, and body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither snow, sow or reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? Our world is an anxious world. Our world is a very busy world. Our world is a confused world, and though we live in it, we do not need to be that way ourselves. We can start by choosing to simplify our lives. I would like to conclude, finally, with a quote from Confucius, which effectively sums up the human experience and something we should consider as we think about this message and as we go forward from these days of unleavened bread back to our routines. He said, life is really simple but we insist on making it complicated.